Ash Wednesday is this uh, thing the church has celebrated for a very long time, and it marks the start of Lent, which is the 40 days leading up to Easter. And it's this time of reflection and preparation, uh, repentance uh, leading up to Easter Sunday. But it's one of those things that we kind of, we either grow up in a, in a church that, that does that and celebrates it, or, or we don't, or we think it's just some Catholic thing, or we think it's some traditional church thing, or whatever, but it's actually a really beautiful thing. It's a really significant thing. And the idea of the ashes, it comes from Genesis 3, 19, which is a verse where God uh, delivered to Adam some, some bad news. So what had happened is they fell into sin, Adam and Eve, and, and where Adam and Eve had once enjoyed the reality of a perfect, pure, holy connection to God, um, because they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would fall into sin. And now God says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. This was bad news for Adam, because before this moment, death was not a thing. Close your eyes for, for a moment. Okay, I'm going to take you on a little journey. Who wants to go on a journey tonight? Just a little. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. I want you to try, with your imagination, to imagine a world with no death. Because if you do that, Let's, let's go to the beach. <laughs> Who likes going to the beach? It's nice. You know what wouldn't be on the beach in a world of no death? Seashells would not be there because the shell washes up on the shore as a result of an animal that died. Think about a lot of the, the, the plants and, and, and the, that when something dies in the forest, new growth comes out of the death of the planet. It creates a, a fertilizer. So a world without death is something that we don't really understand. It's because our context now in life, so removed from this event where Adam and Eve, you can open your eyes now, where Adam and Eve, it wasn't much of a journey. It was like a walk. It was a stroll. But, um, you know, a world of no Death is not something we really understand because our lives are marked by, man, this is going to sound morbid. I know we've started like real pumped up tonight, and that's great. But our, our lives are marked every year. Our birthday, we're getting closer to what? Right? There's this inevitability of it. I remember my little brother. I think my little brother was like this weird little poet guy in like third grade, and he had to write a poem and he wrote about the inevitable march of time towards our impending doom. And I was like, okay, Edgar Allan Poe, where do you, why are you even writing that in the third grade? But it's true. We, it tells us in the Bible that, that from dust we came and from dust we will return. And so the Ash Wednesday, the the, the tradition of placing the ashes on the forehead has come as a reminder of our human condition, really our sinful condition. And that's what Ash Wednesday is, is about, that bad news that just like Adam and Eve, because of our sin, we've been separated from God. You know, throughout our lives, our, our bodies will remind us of our mortality. I feel like ever since I became, like, pastor, my hair's been getting grayer. I feel like, you know what happens with a president? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like every, every sermon, I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's like 10 more. But our bodies are a reminder of our mortality. Oh, they get sick. I'm sure a lot of us, if you're like me, are dealing with some allergies today because of the wind, right? By the way, 
everybody, this is like, this is, we should have called this like bad hair day. Bad hair service instead of Ash Wednesday service. We're, we're aging. Um, and when, when you're young, like all of you are here, that seems so far away, the aging. But I remember, you know, the first time I like turned 30 and then all of a sudden I had a back issue, you know? It's coming. It's coming for you. And, and our bodies are often the ways that we carry out sin in this world. Whether we're hurting somebody, whether we're dishonoring our, our body in, in so many different ways. But of course, also good things. You know, we can, new human life. There's a two-week-old baby. Yeah, look, you stood up right when it was, God made this happen. Everybody say hi to Enzo. He's two, two weeks old? But, but like new life can come from the body. And, and, and we can use, uh, you know, our, our humanity can be used to make a difference, to, to be kind, to, to serve, to help people. So that image of God that is an essential part of who we are as human beings is still there. It has not been completely removed by our sin, but it has been warped and, and twisted by the reality of sin and death. So if Easter Sunday is the good news of the new life and the resurrection, Wednesday's, Ash Wednesday is kind of, Kind of, I don't know if bad news is the right word, but it's sobering news. Because Ash Wednesday reminds us of our sin. It talks about how we, on our own, cannot be good enough to get to God. You know, often we think that God will love us because we've earned it or, or we've worked hard for it. I've gone to church enough, so God loves me. I've prayed enough, so God loves me. I've read the Bible enough, so God must love me. I've given enough to the church. I've, I've served enough. I've, I've done enough. For, I've been, I'm a good person. But you can't be good enough. Because we all, the Bible says we have all fallen short. of The glory of God. And I think Ash Wednesday, as we prepare to go towards Easter, is a reminder of, how far humanity has fallen into sin and death. But Ash Wednesday also signifies hope because we know that, that we have a Savior who has come not based on anything we did or earned, but simply because he, he, he loved us. And he has come to restore us and renew us. And I think the beautiful part of the story, you know what, I love storytelling. And when you have a story, you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning starts at a garden in perfect connection with God. And then, because of the consequences of what happened in the garden, the decisions that Adam and Eve made, humanity has fallen into sin. And that's the middle chapter. That's for my Star Wars fans, The Empire Strikes Back. Then there's the return of the, not the Jedi, but the king, right? Who restores us once again, restores our connection to God. That's the story that's happening. And Ash Wednesday is kind of a reminder of that middle chapter where, where we have fallen short. And it's beautiful to know that, that Jesus has come to restore us to that place. But I think the temptation on Ash Wednesday is to automatically focus on, on the cross of it all and how God has restored it all. But we have to remember that Ash Wednesday is not Good Friday. It's tempting to try and skip over the reflection of ourselves and to be honest with ourselves about how we've fallen short, about I mean, I, man, I can't tell you how many dumb things I think in a day. Seriously, take stock of your day. 
Like how many times did you think something bad of somebody or someone or something? You know, it's tempting to try and skip over that part of the process. Just automatically go to Good Friday, automatically go to Easter Sunday. But Ash Wednesday is a reminder of the consequence of our sin. You know, Ash Wednesday is about our desperate need for the cross. If you've been asking what it's about, that's what it's about. It's about the fact that we need the cross. We need a savior. Taking time on Ash Wednesday to realize that makes Good Friday even, and this isn't even really a word, gooder. Don't use that in an exam uprising. You will fail, as I did. But I like gooder, too. We should add it. No, it sounds bad. You're right. But we desperately need the cross. Ash Wednesday is about looking at our heart, looking at our mind, looking at our soul, our motives, and recognizing that apart from Christ, we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Ash Wednesday is a time to reflect and repent. And when we do, we're given this beautiful promise in Isaiah. So often we have like this fear. I'm, I'm wearing this fear of God. We have this fear of God that, that when we're gonna, when we have, when we have our sin, that, that we're not good enough, that we have to fear him but the fear of God is really a reverence for him. It's, 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 it's a respect and, and worship and, and honor of him. But our sin should not drive us away from Jesus. It's precisely that we do sin that we need Jesus. It's precisely that we have sin that Jesus has come. If we didn't have sin, there'd be no need for a savior. And Jesus knows that. But I, I want to... And tonight, before we go into a time of prayer and worship here, on this scripture, Isaiah 61, 3, it says, I will bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You know, God knows how messed, look, God knows how messed up you are. He knows how messed up I am. He knows all of it. We can't hide anything from God. God knows every part of us down to the last detail. And he knows how broken humanity is. He knows how frail we are. And, and, and he looks at us and he, and he recognizes that in our sin, that without him, we will return to dust. We will die. We will have loss. We, we will have hurt and we will have pain. But God looks at us in all of our brokenness, in all of our hurt, and he says, you know what? You give me that. You trade me the brokenness. You trade me the hurt. You, you, you trade me the despair, and I will ex in, instead exchange it for a garment of praise. And where you have mourning, and where you have loss, and where you have, have death and hurt and pain, I will exchange it for the oil of gladness. Enjoy in your life. Bring me the ashes of, of your failures and your mistakes, the destructions of your, of your relationships, your past abuses, your anxieties, your depressions, your, your doubts, and your fears, and I will trade you instead for a crown of beauty. In other words, God says, you bring me your worst, and I will give you my best. I don't know about you, but that's a good deal. Do you realize that in your life, when you were doing your worst thing, God was preparing his best thing? When you were up to no good, doing the craziest, I did, I did some crazy things, y'all. I should not be up here. But God did not change his mind when he looked at you. And he said, you know what, even at your worst, I'm going to give you my best. I love Paul the Apostle, you know, before he was a church leader and builder, he was against God. And he actually killed Christians, persecuted them and tortured them and imprisoned them. 
And actually, he was on this road on his way to, to, to take out more Christians. When he would have this encounter with God, this collision with grace. And he would never be the same again. And he would take all the worst parts of Paul and trade them for his very best. You know, because even when you're up to no good, God is still pursuing you with his good. When you were in your worst state, God was pursuing you. Maybe you're in your worst state right now. Maybe right now you, you're, you're facing some consequences for something. Maybe you've got shame about something. Maybe you've got guilt about something. Maybe you've, you're in despair right now. Maybe you're, you're depressed. Maybe you're anxious. Maybe you're worried. Maybe you're fearful. Whatever it is, God is coming after you right now. And the Bible tells us actually that that there's no other motive to the freedom he wants to bring to our life than the fact that he wants us to be free. The Bible says it is for freedom that Christ set us free. There's No other motive. He just wants to free you from those things. He wants to take the worst things in your life and exchange you for his best things. The Bible also tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, Starting in verse 16, it said, this is the covenant I will make with them. A covenant is like a promise, an agreement. I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. See, the beautiful thing about God is not only will he exchange you, your worst, for his best, but do you know, unlike us, like we can forgive somebody, but we never really forget. Let's be honest. We never really forget. But God says, when you turn over all that to me, I remember it no more. It's not even in the record anymore. It's gone. It's done. God says, I, I don't even remember that thing. No, I see beyond that. I see you. I see the beautiful child that I created with purpose and intention. You know, our God is the only God that makes this invitation. Our God's the only God crazy enough to exchange the very worst for the very best. I think Ash Wednesday reminds us that in our brokenness, we are still loved. That in the, the ashes of our our life, God can bring out something beautiful. And so I want to end on this scripture from Jesus. I invite the worship team to come out. But Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and, and I will give you rest. Tonight is a reminder of our humanity and our need for Jesus. We desperately need the power of the cross in our lives. Because, you know, there's the cross over there in the corner. If you take a look at it, you know, the cross reveals the fact that we are sinners. Because if we were not, there'd be no need for it. But not only does the cross reveal our sin, the cross reveals your value. Because you have a God who thought you were valuable enough to go to the cross. And the Bible makes it clear time and time again that he would do it all just for the one. He is the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to chase the one. So in all of history, this event that happened 2,000 years ago, if there was just one person who received salvation at the foot of the cross, Jesus would do it all again because he goes after the one. Jesus had to go to the cross for our sin, for our brokenness, for, for the failing of our humanity and our sin. But he did it because we were worth it to him. Look to the person next to you and say, you're worth it. You know, my fears that we've, we have so overcomplicated church. We've made church, we've made the Bible, we've made the relationship with Jesus so complicated. 
It's so complicated. We think we have to do better or be better to be loved by God. We think by doing that we will earn his forgiveness, that we'll earn his favor. But all that Jesus really asks of us is in that scripture where he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You come with your worst, and I will exchange it for my best. You come with your ashes and your brokenness, and I will give you a crown of beauty instead. So I believe tonight is a time to come to him, to spend time And like any good preacher, I've got like three words all starting with the same letter. Three R's. Spend a time in reflection, in repentance, and in reception of what God wants to do. So I want us to take a time to reflect tonight. And there's on the front of your bulletins tonight, those three R's are there. It says reflection. Take some time to to pray and look inwardly at yourself and find those areas where you are falling short, where you do need to confess. You know, the Bible says if we confess our sins that he would be faithful and just to forgive our sins. So we don't have to be worried about that confession. But actually in our confession, we're, we're, we're guaranteed grace. We're guaranteed forgiveness. So I want you to take some time as we worship tonight to reflect and, 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 and let God reveal some things in you that you need to let go of. You know, traditionally, the time of Lent is a time of fasting and letting go of something. And I'm not gonna tell you today, oh, you need to take 40 days from your phone, though you might need to. But I will tell you, you should seek with the Lord tonight and anything that's keeping you from him Anything that's keeping you anxious or fearful or worried or or in doubt, that should be released and surrendered tonight. That should be turned over to him. And repentance, repentance is this heavy church word. And all it means is to turn, to turn towards Jesus. So as you reflect and as you pray, when you find that thing, to repent means to turn it over to him. And so also in your bulletin, there's a blank page. And what I would ask you to do tonight is to take some time, write something down there that before you leave tonight, you're gonna go leave at the foot of the cross. And whatever you place at the cross, you cannot pick up again. So whatever that thing is that God reveals to you in your reflection, as you repent of it, write it down, and go leave it at the cross. And then tonight is also tonight to receive. We're gonna have some prayer teams. In fact, any of our prayer teams, um, our elders, your wives, um, and and the other teams that I have asked, if you all could spread around this room right now, that way they see you, they know where to go. If we can get a youth prayer team, that would be awesome. Um, And also, if you would like ashes, placed upon you tonight as a symbol of your, um, the, the fact that you are human, that you do need Jesus, and that you are covered by the hope and the glory of the cross. Um, we've got a station over there with Jeff and Selena, and then I'll be over here at this table in the back on this side, and we would gladly do those for you as well. So as our prayer teams get ready and come forward, We'll go into this time. And um, a big burden that I've been feeling lately, and one reason I think maybe we've been feeling this big need for revival in our world is because I think we've kind of outsourced our relationship with God to other people a lot of times. We've outsourced our relationship to God. Like we get anything we get, from God comes from somebody else, like a pastor doing a sermon or a worship song we hear. But I believe that God wants you to have a personal, intimate connection with him. That's why he came down and died on the cross, to get to you, so you could come to him, so you could hear him and know him and understand him. And so tonight's all about that. So take some time with him to hear from him, 
to, to reflect, to repent, to receive. Let's pray and then we'll go into this open time of prayer and worship. And if you need prayer, come forward to one of our teams. Let's see what Jesus does tonight. Dear Lord, we recognize today that we cannot be good enough. Lord, we recognize all the ways that we fall short. Lord, we also recognize that you have come to us in mercy and grace and that your heart doesn't move towards us because of our performance, because of how good we are or right we are or moral that we are. Your heart moves because we are your children. And whether we're on a good day or a bad day, you love us all the same. And you have opened an invitation that we can come to you. All of us in our weariness, in our burdens, in our brokenness. We can lay those things down at your cross and find rest and peace. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.